On October 7th, Sadie gave birth to a baby boy two months early. Initially, Charlie thought she was pretending to be in labor and told her to go away. Once it was clear that she was indeed about to deliver, then Charlie took his sweet time shaving and preening in the mirror before he let Sadie focus on her labor pains. Diane recalled, we all dropped everything and gathered around Sadie and got her onto a bed. A birth was a huge and exciting event, but whenever anything happened to Sadie, it took everyone's energy. Charlie took charge and told us to boil water and sterilize things such as a razor blade. We were all gathered around her on all sides while Charlie talked her through the delivery. After the baby whooshed out in a pool of fluids and afterbirth, Charlie told me to cut the baby's umbilical cord with my teeth. Sadie's son, named Zizo Z.C. Zadfrak, was born several weeks premature. Mother and child were sent up the road to nearby Fountain of the World, which had an infirmary. But it was soon realized that the baby needed more intensive medical care and was driven to nearby Ventura Hospital. Days after Susan delivered baby Zizo, Another child was born near Spawn Ranch to Jack and Barbara, the young hippie couple who would later live at the ranch but were currently staying at a nearby horse farm. Their son, named Aaron, was delivered with assistance by several women in the family, according to confidential source Mr. X. He believed that Mary, Lynn, and Leslie were among those who helped Barbara deliver her new child. Sadly, Aaron was born with a significant defect Part of his stomach was outside of his abdomen. Little Aaron was also sent to Ventura Hospital to the neonatal unit there along with Zizo. Susan's child lived, but Aaron succumbed to his birth defects within weeks of his birth. By mid-October, Charlie decided that the family would leave for Death Valley. The caravan headed for the desert on Halloween. Bruce Davis did not join them. He flew to England to study at Church of Scientology headquarters. Death Valley was a stark change in circumstances, even from impoverished Spawn Ranch. As Diane explained, Cappy's grandparents were part-time miners, but were likely part of the migration during the Depression when many families sought to escape the food lines by establishing claims to land they perceived as the last frontier. The claims were for mining, some people used the homes as a potential livelihood or in later years as a retreat when they simply wanted to get away from city life. The mining life was not for everybody. Diane also wrote, The last connection to civilization was the little town of Ballarat, which was more a cluster of buildings than a proper town. Ballarat, now officially considered a ghost town, sits at the foot of the entrance to Golar Wash. We stopped in Ballarat to get soda pop and shoot the breeze with the few grizzled old miners who ran the small store there. All they had were a few candy bars that looked as ancient as they were, and a rusted out refrigerator that hummed loudly. They drove up the highways to the town of Trona, then down a gravel road that rattled the bus, wrote author Jess Braven. When the bus could go no farther, they had to hike the rest of the way a two and a half hour trek. The others who marched ahead had trouble with their packs and sometimes dropped things so they wouldn't have to carry them. You don't want to be in those canyons when it rains, warned Cappy, unless you want to die. There's a reason they're called washes. Manson recalled his first view of Myers Ranch. It was a fair-sized dwelling surrounded by unexpected green vegetation, a nice little oasis in the middle of nowhere. The house had a large front room with a big fireplace, two bedrooms, a small kitchen, and a back porch with an attached bathroom. It was a hell of a lot better than some of the places we had called home. But the visit to Myers Ranch was cut short when Cappy admitted that she didn't have permission to stay there. Her folks might return any time and make them leave. So Charlie and Paul went into Ballarat and asked about other properties. 
A local pantomath known as Ballarat Bob told them about Barker Ranch, owned by a woman named Arlene Barker, who was not currently living at the property. Manson contacted Arlene, a recent widow originally from Oklahoma, and to woo her, gave her a gold record he'd inherited from Dennis Wilson. He told her he was the Beach Boys' manager, and she agreed to let the family stay at her ranch while she remained at her primary residence near Los Angeles. For the next two weeks, life in Death Valley was pretty fun. Games of swashbucklers and pirates, of Bedouin nomads and pioneers ensued. Death Valley kindled one of Manson's interests, the stories of Rommel's World War II desert raids. General Erwin Rommel, the Nazi's desert fox, led Germany's North Africa excursions from 1941 to 1943. After successful campaigns in Poland, the Netherlands, and France, Rommel was sent to Tripoli where, with fortified tanks suited for desert sands, the Nazis attacked Allied forces. Rommel was known for his dogged determination and rapid developing mobile style of battle leadership. Manson was fascinated with Rommel and his desert raids. When Charlie was arrested the next fall, copies of National Geographic with articles on Rommel were with him. Manson was already spouting anti-Semitic talk justifying the genocide of the Holocaust. Juanita said, I remember Charlie talking about Hitler having been right, that the world needed a big purging every once in a while. And I remember saying, if Hitler were here now, I'd be dead. He just laughed and said, no, you missed the point. It's got nothing to do with whether or not you've got Jewish blood. It has to do with purging the world and having only people who can survive. The only thing that was wrong with those people is that they weren't smart enough to figure out how to escape it. But discovery and exploration were the family's main pursuits in Death Valley. Before a month passed, Manson said, we knew every rock, gully, bush, spring, and old mining claim within miles. We learned that in the daytime, rattlesnakes and other varmints shift to the shady side of a rock or bush, so it was safest to pass on the sunny side of what might be a lair. At night, you stayed away from the part of the rock that received the most sun during the day, since at night, the snakes used the warmth of the rocks as heating pads. Adam Go rightly wrote, One of the things that most appealed to Charlie about the desert was that it was a ready-made acid trip, from its enchanting rock formations to its wondrous sunsets. Death Valley is perceived of as a place where nary a trickle of water runs, a place devoid of life. Life does indeed abound there, but it is only the hardiest and wildest of animals that survive in these harsh environs. The Manson family's sojourn into the desert was a societal withdrawal from the continual harassment they'd begun to experience from the man. It was also a spiritual quest, where it was felt they could finally become one as a family. Another aspect of the desert which fascinated Manson was that it was a land where rivers ran upside down, a fact that appealed to Charlie's no-sense-makes-sense worldview. But after a couple weeks, everyone but Charlie tired of the family's desert romp. Even getting to the nearest grocery store was a several-hour ordeal. Plus, there were dangerous snakes, spiders, and scorpions, and a lack of hygiene. While everyone professed to love the desert, it became clear that many were getting bored, explained Paul Watkins. Gradually, things on a spiritual level began to degenerate. Manson began to test people's loyalty and an endurance. I pretty well did whatever he told me to, Juanita admitted. I mean, for me to walk 40 miles, I had blisters on the soles of my feet that were two and a half inches in diameter because Charlie wanted me to go somewhere and I didn't have a car, so I walked. If Charlie said jump, my only question would be, how high? Tensions mounted. There were two small babies with the family, and when their mothers conflicted with Charlie, he took it out on their offspring. Susan wrote, He frequently became cruel, manifest most horribly, when he would take my baby by the feet and swing him around and around, high over his head, and then down to within an inch of the rocky ground. 
He was crazy at those moments. But a split second later, he would seem to be full of love for the children, which he continued to think of as gods or kings. Watkins recalled witnessing Manson's decline. One night, during a rap, he paused in the middle of a sentence and stared straight ahead, as though addressing a presence above our heads. I came to you, he said softly, his face wearing a distracted expression. As a deer in the forest, I came to you with wonder in my eyes and love in my heart for you. I came to you with love, and you slaughtered me. Though it didn't register consciously at the time, his statement was a prophetic one. It was the first sign that the flower child in Charlie Manson was dying, wilting away in Death Valley. Charlie felt like all he did was love and give and nurture these kids, and what did he have to show for it? Where was his recording career? Where was the fame and wealth he was due? This wasn't how it was supposed to be. Maybe he was sick of doing for those kids what nobody ever did for him. Sometime in November, Charlie walked away. Restless, angry, spiteful, he decided to punish those little punks by leaving. He dumped some cold coffee into a canteen, grabbed a hunk of day-old bread, and left at dawn to walk toward the Panamint Mountains and watch the sunrise. Two hours later, he'd stomped most of his frustration away. He sat on a rock to eat his prospector's breakfast and determine how much further it was to the next valley. After his appetite was sated, he began walking again. By 6 p.m., Charlie was lost. He was also cold, tired, suffering leg cramps and thirst. His tongue was swollen in his mouth, his body streaked with sweat and dirt. Something broke inside the man, and he fell down, weeping and half-crazed. After having a brief conversation with a rather large rock, Ration kicked in. He had a stern talking to himself and decided to just sleep it off. When Charlie woke in the morning, he felt refreshed and alive. He hurt, and he was damn thirsty, but he had enough strength to make it back to the ranch. When he arrived at Barker Ranch, everyone ran out, jumping on him in their glee at his return. Manson returned from his trip into the abyss with newfound enthusiasm and dedication for his music. We spent hours each day practicing, arranging, and writing songs, and the music was often so good it gave me goosebumps. The acoustics out in the open didn't compare with the studio setup, but the quiet, open desert added its own magic to our music. Without microphones or amplifiers, there was a pure, earthy quality to our instruments and voices. We were a bunch of kids sitting around an open bonfire in one of the most primitive areas in the nation, but our arrangements and lyrics were as modern and free as our philosophy. God, there was so much talent there. We had reached a level of accomplishment that was amazing. But the onus wasn't just on his talents and the support of his minstrel family. Manson was also relying upon the golden penetrators, Dennis Wilson, Greg Jacobson, and Terry Melcher, to pave the way to recording superstardom. So he and several others drove back to Los Angeles to get the ball rolling. He left Paul and the rest behind at Barker Ranch. In the spring of 1967, after spending a majority of his youth and young adulthood in the correction system, Charles Manson was freed. For the next year and a half, he made extraordinary attempts to integrate into society even if it was a society of his own making. But Manson, like Richard III, who declared, I am myself alone, and like all psychopaths and sociopaths, was doomed by his very nature to always stand a bit apart. Even as he built a small social world of outsiders, his contrary nature drove him from the world he had made. If he had held fast to his decision that day in Death Valley, to depart his followers and leave them to their own devices, I am convinced that Manson would never have been convicted of murder. Crimes, certainly. Manson was an institutionalized criminal, after all. 
He was also a type B personality who believed that other people did not feel things as fully as he did and could be used, manipulated, robbed as he saw fit. But Charlie would probably never have directed anyone to murder people were it not for the fact that he walked back to the ranch that November desert morning. Charlie had spent up to 20 months with these people, starting with Mary Bruner in Berkeley. He lived with them, counseled them, fed them, stole for them, made love with them, delivered their babies. It was the longest amount of time he had spent with any group of people in his adulthood. These were the most intimate relationships of his life and the most challenging. Manson spoke of love frequently during the late 60s. He espoused the practice of love. He incorporated elements of love in his sermons. He shared physical love with his family. But the moment he began to submit to actually loving his followers, he panicked and tried to escape. Love is not an easy emotion. It is fraught with fear and sensitivities, prejudices and passions. Love requires us to grow, to accept, to submit. Any sociopath will have a difficult time submitting to love. An institutionalized sociopath will eventually reject intimate relationships. A psychopath will lash out in retaliation. Mary, Oish, Squeaky, Katie, Bruce, Sadie, Snake, Bobby, Yeller, Brenda, Stephanie, Little Paul, Sandy, Tex, Brooks, Clem, Gypsy, Lulu, Juanita, TJ, Cappy. They were all getting under his skin and more importantly, into his heart. Everything inside of him wanted to reject them, their love. Charlie's fatal flaw, the one that also proved the death knell for several innocent human beings and led to lifelong imprisonment for several of his followers, is that he didn't reject his family. He fought his nature, his loner inclinations, He returned from his angry walk into the desert, his emotional descent that evening, his long journey back the following day, because he wanted to love them. He wanted to be a better man. He wanted to deserve of their love. He shouldn't have bothered. If Charlie had kept walking, he'd have wandered into the desert and continued until he found the next generous person who would give him time, attention, money, and then he would have soon left them and begun the journey again. He likely would never have gathered people around him quite the way he had in 67 and 68, if he had left that day. He would have limited intimate relationships and therefore mitigated his own homicidal tendencies. Charlie might have spent the rest of his life as a drifter rather than the most notorious inmate in America. He would have been alone, but free. He'd have spent his final years perhaps in a state-run nursing home, feeling up the hot nurses, watching Pawn Stars or some nonsense on television. He could have been gumming oatmeal in the dining room and dreaming of the days, so brief but so halcyon, when he had a group of young beauties surrounding him in the California sunshine. Instead, he sat in a jail cell for nearly 50 years, waiting to die. If Charlie hadn't been a psychopath, he'd have let the magic of 1968 simmer and fade as it inevitably would. He might have maintained a few of his most loyal supporters for a time. They could have played their music and enjoyed their drugs and faded in obscurity. There wouldn't have been a record deal, but there would have been music and there would have been family and there would have been love, real love. Staying and loving and supporting these people playing their music and having fun, but accepting that that was all it would be, that wasn't enough for Manson. And walking away, turning his back on these loyal young people who believed in him, departing into the unknown, that wasn't enough either. Charlie had to fulfill his true purpose in life by destroying the people who loved him. In late 68, when he drove back to Los Angeles from Death Valley, Charlie became a heat-seeking missile bent on destruction. Anything less than total annihilation, total mayhem, and total betrayal of those who cared for him would have been to choose mediocrity, to cease to exist. All he really wanted, not love, not a family, not even a meaningful music career, was fame. 
Charles Manson was not much different than the Kardashians, the Real Housewives, the Bachelors and Bachelorettes, the Cash Me Outside Girl, the ones who used to show up on the Jerry Springer show. What made Manson different than typical fame whores was his diagnosis of an antisocial personality disorder. If Charlie was 34 years old today, he'd still be convincing people to kill for him, but perhaps with his own damn reality show. That's why what happened next is so important. 